Hi, I'm Hal Roberts. This is Bridge City News. Welcome. Here's some of the top stories we've been following. Canada's highest court upheld rules that support compensation for air passengers who experience delayed flights or damaged bags on international flights. The Alberta government is launching a $16 million initiative officials say will support better health care in rural regions of the province. And we hear from those at a local high school who are participating in a program helping to provide shoes for kids in need. Your nation. Your province. Your southern Alberta. From the heart of Lethbridge, it's Bridge City News with Hal Roberts. Thanks so much for joining us. The top court in Canada has upheld rules that support compensation for air passengers who are subjected to delayed flights or damaged luggage on international flights. The Supreme Court of Canada dismissed an appeal by Air Canada, Porter Airlines and many other parties that challenged the country's passenger rights charter. They didn't like the fact that this new set of passenger compensation rules, passenger protection regulations, were demanding that, that travelers, their customers, receive up to $1,000 if a plane was late or canceled for a reason that fell within the airline's control, such as um, crew issues, for example. Um, they wanted those rules overturned, and they had some uh, slightly obscure arguments as to why it should be overturned, and that challenge, as of today, we learned from the Supreme Court ruling, has failed. This decision means airlines are going to continue to have to pay millions of dollars each year to customers, sometimes thousands to an individual customer. But even still, the amount of compensation that airlines have doled out is uh, just a mere fraction of the billions in revenue that the airline industry in Canada generates. So another question about this ruling is that now that it's gone, now that it's occurred, uh, the efforts by the government to further tighten its regulations, which have been underway for uh, a year and a half or so, uh, to what extent will they impose uh, a greater financial burden on, on carriers that have now lost this initial battle? Air Canada and others argue that the Air Passenger Protection Regulation, launched in 2019, violates global standards and should be rendered invalid for international flights. The Alberta government says it is taking action to improve health care in rural and remote communities in the province. Now that includes the introduction of a $16 million rural and remote family medicine resident physician bursary pilot program. Health Minister Adriana Lagrange says this initiative will allow better access to medical services in many rural regions. So this three-year plan will guide government's efforts in improving rural and remote health care and closing the gap between Albertans' care in urban centres and in surrounding areas and making sure that they get the care that they need in rural and remote communities. So it's really emphasizing the rural remote communities having the care that they need and through this action plan there will be key focuses one being access another being community care the third being prevention and wellness the fourth being workforce and the other key area is the fifth which is creating innovative care models and solutions that serve the unique needs in rural and remote communities Minister LaGrange says the province is also implementing two grant programs to attract and retain more paramedics for rural, First Nation, Métis and Inuit communities. October is National Child Abuse Prevention Month. Now, sadly, so many of our young people are victims of sexual, physical and mental abuse. Cyril Turton is Alberta's Minister of Children and Family Services. He says his government is taking the necessary steps to protect many of our most vulnerable and oftentimes it begins with the child advocacy centers. You know, these centers do such an incredible job throughout the entire province. Uh, there's eight of them and they are really the first line of defense when it comes to providing those safe places for children to heal uh, that have gone through some horrible incident of sexual abuse. As well, over the last year, as a government, we've invested over $5 million with Little Warriors. Again, this is a fantastic program up here in northern Alberta, and they have a, a clinical approach to looking after children. Um, and, and some of the stories that they're dealing with, uh, as uh, many of your viewers can probably attest to, is, is absolutely horrific. And the fact that they're able to do such incredible work helping out these vulnerable children, again, just a great testament to the team over there. And of course, our family resource networks, they are throughout the entire province, from Lacrete to Lethbridge, from Banff to Lloydminster. 
our hub and spoke model and family resource networks, again, provide a lot of those preventative services that I know so many families, almost 125,000 families uh, right across the province utilize our family resource network. Minister Turton adds there's a phone number to call when a child's safety is at risk. It's called the Child Intervention Line and it's toll free at 1-800-638-0715. Ontario Conservative MP Michael Barrett blasted the Liberals on Parliament Hill today, saying Mark Carney needs to be held accountable for the amount of tax dollars going to friends of the Liberal Party. Since taking on the role, the friends and business interests of Carbon Tax Carney have benefited with billions of tax dollars, $2 billion for his buddy at Talisad and Brookfield getting a seat at the table to get their hands on $10 billion Canadian tax dollars. Suddenly, Carbon Tax Carney is raising funds for these Liberals in exchange for all of those billions. So will they cooperate with an investigation from Canada's lobbying commissioner? But what this member wants to cloud is the fact that, Madam Speaker, inflation's down. Interest rates are down. Wage settlements are up. The economy is up. We've reached a soft landing in this country. They should stop talking the country down. We're going to continue lifting the country up. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and Foreign Affairs Minister Melanie Jolie are in France for the Francophonie Summit. The conflicts in the Middle East are expected to be a hot topic of discussion for leaders. Jolie was scheduled to meet with her French counterpart to discuss how to bring stability and peace to the region. She also met with Lebanon's information minister during the summit. I'll have the chance to meet the Minister of Information of Lebanon uh, to be able to talk about what's going on in Lebanon. At the same time, we're working also as an organization on a specific statement on the Middle East. Uh, since Lebanon is an important uh, member state of uh, Francophonie. We condemn what Iran did last week by attacking Israel in an unprecedented way, um, and we were all reassured that there was no uh, loss of innocent lives. At the same time, we absolutely need to make sure that this does not become a full-scale war, and that's why we need a ceasefire. A plane carrying crucial medical aid from UN agencies landed in Lebanon as the fighting between Israel and the terrorist group Hezbollah intensifies. This is a shipment that has been organized by the WHO and UNHCR and supported by uh, the United Arab Emirates. It contains 40 tons of medical supplies, mainly trauma kits, that will be crucial to support the hospitals as they receive the uh, casualties from the Israeli attacks on Lebanon. Meanwhile, 19 Palestinians were killed in what military officials say was the deadliest Israeli airstrike in the West Bank since October the 7th. اللي صار إنه غارة عنيفة جدا ما شفناش إلها سابق منذ انتفاضة الأقصى والحمد لله رب العالمين يعني تم استشهاد 16 شخص بما فيهم عائلة كاملة مسيحت من السجل المدني الأب والأم والأطفال. You know, we're approaching the one-year anniversary of the terrorist attack by Hamas in southern Israel that claimed around 1,200 lives. Close to 100 hostages taken by the terrorist group have still not been released to come home. TBN Israel correspondent Yair Pinto says October 7th is a day that the people of Israel will never forget. He also says it's been amazing to see how many countries have supported Israel in their fight against terrorism. To see such unity, I mean, people from different backgrounds that are from the left side of the political uh, view to the right side, to orthodox, to seculars, all uniting together in defending Israel, because I think everybody realized that we are fighting for our life. Yes, and the and enemy we doesn't care if you vote uh, Netanyahu or if you vote uh, someone else. Yeah. So they just wanted to kill everybody. And just to make a point of that, many of the communities uh, adjacent to the Gaza Strip were actually super extreme left peace, peace uh, advocates yeah. with the Palestinians. And Hamas terrorists didn't care. And they slaughtered them, kidnapped them just the same. Flooding from Hurricane Helene caused severe damage to drinking water utilities in the southeastern United States. As crews work to repair badly damaged systems, the threat of illnesses spreading 
grows as time passes. Oh yeah, it's like it's very interesting kind of going back to having nothing available and then trying to figure out how to be resourceful with what you had to to uh, I guess survive. We lost all of our water, so we went to very rationed water. So we're dealing with a lot of having to go to water stations and pick up water. We'll take potable water and we'll wash dishes with it or wash our hands, wash our face and our bodies, and then collect all of that uh, into a bucket as gray water. And then we'll take that and we'll use that for flushing the toilets and stuff like that. Well, here in southwestern Alberta, Environment Canada issued a wind warning for our region today. Jeanette Rocher is in now with an early look at the forecast. Jeanette, how strong were the winds here in the Windy City? Well, putting it plainly, Hal, uh, way too strong for most of our liking. So we, we're seeing wind gusts up to 100 kilometers per hour in the region today. Those should be weakening uh, this evening. Now, wind warnings are issued when there's a significant risk of damaging winds. So damage can occur to buildings or homes, uh, such as roof shingles blowing off or damage to windows, that type of thing. Uh, the good news about today, though, is we were also the hot spot in Canada, at least for part of the day we reached 25 degrees which exceeded our daytime expected high of 22 uh, so good news there now what does the rest of the weekend look like okay well it's going to be a lot less warm and a little less windy so i'll be back later in the show to give you all those details great thanks so much jeanette coaldale is celebrating their new secondary school located next to the shift recreation center Prairie Wind Secondary held a grand opening ceremony on Friday to officially welcome over 650 students. The new school will have a black box theater, as state-of-the-art eSports room, a woodworking shop, and expanded sports programs. As Coldale continues to grow, community leaders are excited about how the school can accommodate even more students in the future. It's almost been like a Christmas moment for a lot of these students. They come in, I, I got to see a lot of them come in the building for the first time and just see the awe and wonder as they were looking around when they were seeing what this building looked like compared to what the old school would look like. Actually, it's essential to grow a province in a, in a very strategic and balanced way. Uh, there are people definitely moving to our large centres, Calgary and Edmonton, but there are lots of people moving into all of our smaller communities. Th they thrive around uh, community buildings like this as well. So it's good for our economy to make sure it's balanced, that we're building schools equally uh, as best we can. And uh, it, it matters a lot. In, in small towns and the rural communities of Alberta, these are the heartbeat of those towns. By the way, Prairie Wind Secondary in Coaldale has capacity for 850 students. According to the province, the cost to build was approximately $40 million. You know, more than just volunteering, it's all about working together as a community so that no child in Lethbridge in southwestern Alberta has to go without shoes. That's the mindset of the faith and action students at Catholic Central High School. Shoes for Kids president Mallory Christensen explains how well the program is going in its fourth year. This year alone, in this month alone, we have supported over 500 students with a brand new pair of shoes for the first month back into their education endeavors. This is for elementary, middle school, and also high school students throughout Southwest Alberta. We have never seen these numbers before and we needed some extra support. Three students from CCH immediately stepped up when the opportunity was provided to them to help raise awareness that children in our local community do not have a brand new pair of shoes to comfortably walk to and from school. CCH students are helping to collect shoes. They are doing inventory counts. They are getting shoes out to students throughout the community and they are also providing information and awareness throughout to local businesses within Lethbridge. Shoes are everyday thing. Every time we go, we put these shoes on. And well, the first day I was like, I just, like I wanna like get my 40 hours done, but after a few more days, I just, I didn't really care about it anymore and I just wanted to do this for the kids. Me personally, volunteering is very important because like you can go out and help other people and not that, oh, I need it for to graduate. It's that the thought in your head that I'm being a good person and I'm being, and I'm helping out my community and um, it's just great overall for everybody. 
Now, organizers say those who need shoes can turn to their family school liaison counselor or student support worker. And those who'd like to donate, meanwhile, can still do so by dropping off new shoes at either Freddy's Paint in Lethbridge or any RBC branch. The Alberta government has renewed a grant to Lethbridge Polytechnic to continue its educational services to incarcerated individuals. The Polytechnic's Lakeshore campus, located at the Lethbridge Correctional Center, will be given $2.1 million over the next few years to continue offering programs such as academic upgrading, personal development and job employment skills training. Inmates also have the opportunity to work in various workshops that really benefit the community. Uh, this partnership ensures that they get quality education uh, is being provided to the offender and that the programmes are addressing the current needs of the labour market probably in society. The interaction with the community indirectly is if I take the, the carpentry workshop and the, the small engine workshop, we're not allowed to sell anything, but we can donate to community organisations. So we donate tables and chairs to organisations like Lethbridge Family Services. And we've also, when we refurbish snowblowers and uh, lawnmowers uh, and edge trimmers, we actually donate them in the area as well. So I think it's, you know, the, the interaction with the community and the service to the community is often overlooked. The Polytechnic and Correctional Centre have been in partnership since the 1970s and has recently been providing correspondence to the Medicine at Remand Centre for the past couple of years. A new study out by Stats Canada says the province with the highest life expectancy is Quebec. The research says residents in La Belle Province live to an average of 82.48 years, which is just over a year above the national average. Ontario was in second place with a life expectancy of 81.82 years. Prince Edward Island ranked third with residents living to an average age of 81.65 years. British Columbia came in at number four at 81.46. What's interesting, however, is that women in BC have the highest life expectancy in all of Canada at 84.3 years. Alberta rounded out the top five with an average life expectancy of 80.22 years. And in our province, women are living to 82.64 years, while men are hitting the 77.91 mark. New Brunswick came in at number six, Nova Scotia number seven, number eight was Manitoba at 79.14 years, Newfoundland and Labrador number nine, the Yukon number 10, Saskatchewan number 11 at 78.49 years, and the folks in the Northwest Territories at number 12. At the bottom of the list was none of it with an average life expectancy of only 71.67 years. You know, life is often filled with highs and lows. Chris Maxwell, author of Things We've Handed Down, knows this all too well as he suffered from a near-fatal bout of encephalitis and now lives with epilepsy. He shares how his faith is not ignoring the reality of your situation, but its full dependency upon Jesus and surrendering and allowing him to carry us through the valleys of life. His strength is made perfect where? In the scar tissue, in the wounds, in the, in the hurts, in if we notice our wounds and we invite Jesus to be right in the middle of our narrative, we'll notice his wounds. He is the one who brings healing to us, but he's the wounded healer. Uh, he, he comes with the scars and the disappointments, shed blood for us so that we can be a part of his story. Make sure you catch my full interview with Chris Maxwell, author of Things We've Handed Down, coming up in the second half of our program. While we saw lots of cloud cover and felt some strong winds once again today in Lethbridge, hopefully they'll be dying down just in time for the weekend. A full look of the weather picture is coming up. Every autumn here in Lethbridge, we receive just a little bit more wind. In fact, Environment Canada issued a wind warning earlier today. Jeanette Roche is now with all of the weather details. Jeanette, with the wind we've been receiving lately, it's not exactly like kite flying weather right now, is it? Yeah, maybe a little too strong for that, uh, Hal. Uh, we were seeing gusts up to 100 kilometers per hour. Now, to put that into perspective, 119 kilometers per hour is considered a Category 1 hurricane. So there you go. We were very close to that uh, hurricane force wind out there. Uh, but the good news is it should diminish to only 80K winds this evening and then 60K winds on a Saturday. But a high of 18 degrees Saturday, clear skies, and then up to 20 on Sunday, 20 more on Monday, 
uh, which is going to be just lovely. Back to 23 on Tuesday, 24 again on Wednesday, and then a high of 18 degrees on Thursday. So we're doing very well uh, temperature-wise because the average high for this time of year is 17. Average low, 2 degrees. Uh, our record high on this day happened back in 1943 there. It was 29 degrees, and the record low on this day was minus 9, happening back in 1916. Sun rose this morning at 736, and our sun set this evening right at 701. So we're now looking at 11 hours and 25 minutes of daylight, three minutes shorter than yesterday. Okay, on the West Coast, we are seeing 16 degrees expected tomorrow in Victoria, 17 for the high in Vancouver. Clear skies across Alberta. Edmonton sitting at 15 and Calgary at 18. Now, when we get to the rest of the prairies, we're seeing very windy conditions and also some rain. So we've got 60% chance of showers in Saskatoon, up to 60K winds there, 10 degrees for a high. Regina seeing up to 80 kilometer per hour winds, 60% chance of showers, 13 for the high, and 30% chance of showers in Winnipeg, 19. And also some fairly strong gusty winds happening in Winnipeg as well. As we see the central portion of the country, clear skies all around. Toronto and Ottawa sitting at 19 and a lovely 20 degree day tomorrow in Montreal. As we get to the Maritimes, we're seeing more rain and also some fog. So fog developing overnight in most of these places and dissipating in the mornings. We're seeing a 60% chance of showers in Fredericton tomorrow, 18 for the high. Halifax sitting at 18 as well with a 30% chance. 60% chance again in Charlottetown with 18 and a high of 16 tomorrow with the uh, increasing clouds in the morning there in St. John. So there you have it. That's your forecast. Amazon Canada is ramping up hiring efforts for the upcoming Christmas shopping season. The company says it will be hiring 9,000 employees in full-time, part-time and seasonal roles across the country. The holiday shopping period is the busiest time of year for both online and brick and mortar retailers, which often have sales to entice consumers planning to shop early for gifts. Amazon Canada says five new delivery stations will be opening up in Alberta, British Columbia and Ontario in an effort to deliver products that much faster. Countries in the European Union have voted to implement duties on Chinese EVs, which if imposed would follow similar actions from Canada and the United States. Talks are ongoing between Brussels and Beijing to end the standoff before the October 31st deadline as EVs have become a flashpoint in a broader trade dispute over the influence of Chinese government subsidies on European markets. The duties will come into effect at the end of the month unless China finds a solution to end the standoff. Talks will resume on Monday of next week. Now, here's a look at today's markets. The TSX was up 194 points on the day to finish at 24,162. The Dow was up 341 points to 42,352. The S&P 500 was up 51 on the day to 5751. And the Nasdaq was up 219 points to 18,137. West Texas Intermediate Oil was up 96 cents to 7467 US per barrel. Natural gas was down 13 cents to 284 US. Gold was down 331 on the day to 2652.45 US an ounce. And silver was up 15 cents to 32.19 US an ounce. Feed wheat is at $7.97 per bushel. Barley's at 609. Canola's at 1412. And corn is at 749 per bushel. Live cattle were up a dollar to $187. Feeder cattle were down 218 to 264.48, and lean hogs were up 90 cents to 87.33. The Canadian dollar was down slightly over the past 24 hours to 73.70 US. Recapping one of our top stories. Canada's top court has upheld rules that support compensation for air passengers who are subjected to delayed flights or damaged luggage on international flights. The Supreme Court of Canada dismissed an appeal by Air Canada, Porter Airlines and 16 other groups who challenged the country's passenger rights charter. So what is the best way of reaching young people for Christ? How about those who are in university or college? Sometimes that can be a challenge. Coming up, we're going to chat with Chris Maxwell, campus pastor at Emmanuel College in Georgia, about the approach he takes when spreading the gospel to students. When you see news happening in your community, be sure to drop us an email at info at bridgecitynews.ca. Also, be sure to visit our website anytime to check out a number of stories and interviews.
Life is a strange mix of things, isn't it? I mean, we've all experienced it, disappointments and a lot of joy along the way and some celebration. But how do we bring hope for those in the middle of disappointment? Today's guest has a few thoughts on the idea. Joining us right now from Franklin Springs, Georgia, is Chris Maxwell. He's the director of spiritual life and campus pastor at Emmanuel College. He's also a best-selling author with his latest book being titled, Things We've Handed Down. Chris, welcome to Bridge City News. Hey, thank you, Al. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Oh, you bet. Now, why was it so important you feel to write a book like this, Things We've Handed Down? Yes, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Uh, you know, this is my 12th book, and I was like, I want to write this as if it's my last book. Now, I hope it isn't, but I wanted to write it with that in mind. And, and so I wrote this, what do I want to hand down to the younger generation? I mean, like right here in my office, I spend time with, with college students and also people of all ages, but thinking of this younger generation and the luggage they carry, the wounds and the scars, how their lives, how their lives have been affected by so many things through so many years. And I wanna bring hope to them, but also talk about the real issues. And, and so it was like, that's what I wanna hand down to them, but we, we needed kind of a new twist and just a new angle to do that. And so I decided to let the books, which have impacted my life the most, be the things, the books that I'm handing down to them. So lessons that are learned through books that have impacted my life, th those provide the hope that I want to hand down to this younger generation. Now, Chris, you are living with epilepsy and you also had a near fatal bout with encephalitis. How has this really changed your outlook on life? Oh, it, it drastically changed me. And um, this is when I was pastoring a church in Orlando, Florida. My wife, Debbie, and I were watching our three sons grow up so fast. And I was like, always healthy. I mean, I was pastoring the church, writing curriculum, uh, speaking, uh, coaching sports, and I became very sick. And it took them a while to determine what the cause was, but eventually they put me in the hospital uh, my wife, Debbie, thought she's going to take me to the hospital and then bring me back home and everything's going to be OK. Well, uh, that, that was not the case. Uh, she did not know that when she eventually brought me back home from the hospital, that I would be a very different man than the one that she brought there um, because I was suffering, as you mentioned, from encephalitis. And they did not know if I would live. Uh, but if I did live, they now think about this. I was pastoring. I mean, writing and speaking and caring for people, that's what I did. They did not know if I would ever speak again or write again. And um, so one of the long-term effects of that, uh, of that disease that thank God I lived through, uh, but I live now with uh, severe brain damage, uh, scar tissue in the left temporal lobe of the brain, and epilepsy is a result of that, as a result of the scar tissue. But God, so, is, but uh, God is not finished with you yet, right? Oh, yeah, see, isn't that amazing how he meets us right in the middle of the storm, not waiting till everything goes just right or the way that we pre would prefer that it goes. Uh, one of my editors that I wrote for before the illness and I've written for him many years uh, since the illness, he said, Chris the scholar became Chris the poet um, because I don't, um, I'm, don't have the memory that I had before. I don't have the intellect that I had before. I'm not considered the scholar, but I know the importance of stories, stories about pain and wounds and hurts. Uh, because I can relate. Uh, our lives change drastically. And not just my life. I mean, it has to be plural. Uh, the lives of our three sons change drastically. Uh, the lives of all the people in our congregation uh, changed drastically. And I had to depend, in this interesting, I had to learn to depend on the help of others, which we should be doing anyway, more of community. So it wasn't just Chris on the stage. Now it was Chris at the table with many other people willing to help me through my struggles. Uh, so I'm so grateful, I'm thankful that I'm able to do what I can do and, and now God is using my disability to bring his truth around the world for me to tell stories about the pain, the questions, the uncertainty and do it with a smile, do it with some tears, but do it with hope in the middle of the uncertainty. And like God says, my strength will be known through your weakness, right? I will make you strong. So, so Chris, why have you dedicated much of your career ministering on college campuses? 
Yeah, it, when I was when I was pastoring the church in Orlando, I I, I noticed that I, we really didn't have a ministry for uh, the college age students and the young adults, and so I started that ministry, not knowing at the time I would eventually leave that church and become um, the director of spiritual life at Emmanuel University. But God knew that, and it was the perfect time for me to just develop relationships and begin connecting with the younger generation. And I'm going to be honest with you; I mean, I've been here since. A summer of 2006, and I love it. Like every year, I love it even more. Um, when, as you and I are having this this conversation now, I'm thinking of a recent chapel service where we were emphasizing chapter one in my new book, uh, things we've handed down. Chapter one is disappointment with God, and I had uh, students and faculty and staff just telling stories about when have they been disappointed. But how did God help them through the pain? And just listening to the students tell their stories and the faculty and staff tell stories about disappointment, storms, uncertainty, just difficult seasons of life. But be able to say it, not with a fake performance smile, but a deep inner hope that I'm not alone. I have people with me and I have God with me, even in the middle of these difficult times. So that, that's what I have a heart for, spending time with students, listening to them. They need people to listen to them. They live in a culture where they just stare at a screen and everything's got to be quick. No, they are desperate for mentors, for life coaches, for true pastors, not just CEOs of a, of a well-known ministry, but true pastoral heart that can show them care and love in the middle of these life storms. Now, you say that you're doing a ministry as a wounded healer. Can you explain that, Chris? Yeah, that's a good question. Before, I was trying to bring help to people who were wounded, but I learned the best way to do that is to notice our own wounds and be willing to talk about them and to ask questions to other people about, about their wounds. Um, faith, true faith from a biblical perspective, is not living in denial of the bad things that are happening to us and try to just confess, well, all is good, all is good. No, things are not all good. The, the things are bad. I am brain damaged. I live with epilepsy. That's not a negative confession. That is a statement of reality. It is a medical truth. But the, the big truth in that is what you said earlier. His strength is made perfect where? In the scar tissue, in the wounds, in the in the hurts. And if we notice our wounds and we invite Jesus to be right in the middle of our narrative, we'll notice his wounds. He is the one who brings healing to us, but he's the wounded healer. Uh, he, he comes with the scars and the disappointments, shed blood for us so that we can be a part of his story. And that has honestly, it's helped me survive. And it's the story I want to tell others to know that Jesus is with them. He brings his scars. We can relate. And he sits with us at the table and he's willing to listen to us as we release our worry about our own scars. So Chris, why do you feel it is so important for the younger online streaming social media generation to really sit down and read a good book? Yeah, I mean, some of the statistics are scary about those who are willing to read and some who are even in college who do not know how to read. Well, I believe one of the reasons it's important for me to talk about this topic is uh, after the illness, I had to learn to read again. So I have a lot of sympathy and care to those who struggle. So I'm not just going to point a finger at them and say, read more. I'm going to be like, OK, let's talk about it. Why is that hard for you? Because I had to go to I had to go through speech therapy, and I was the writer and the reader, Chris, who loves books, and I had to learn to write and read all over again. And I think I I, I think I love it more now than ever. And I want to be able to tell stories about books, just just what I've done in this book, things we've handed down, talk about, write about the books which have have impacted my life and do it in such a way that it's it's kind of motivating others. Hey, I need to turn some pages also. I need to find some stories because this is what happens is we read stories like the ones I've written in this book. We notice ourselves in those stories. And when we read stories about pain and hurt, but also hope and healing, uh, we see ourselves there. We're on those pages. 
And I'm trying to, to get many people to open the page, not just be so busy and living in this high tech world. We need the high touch of narratives, of stories, of poems and rewiring our brain thinking and not just uh, all right, give me the, give me the quick summary because I have to go on to something else. We need the we need the deep truth so we can be better aware of where we truly are in life and what God wants us to do. So, yeah, turn the pages, open the books, find hope in the nouns and the verbs and the paragraphs and every page. Oh, I invite I invite people to do that. Hey, your passion for books is evident behind you there. I mean, look at your library and all of the books <laughs> behind you, quite a few of them. Yeah. Now, Chris, in your book, you share what helped you cope during some of the lowest moments in your life. Can you share a couple of examples? Yeah, there, there are several. Uh, one of the chapters is uh, from the book Love, Acceptance, and Forgiveness. And often we um, think of more of just God, what rules is he bringing to us? What instructions is he giving us? And, and, and we know the, the Bible includes those, but, but we often miss out on the, on the wonder of he is loving us. He is accepting us and he is forgiving us. If we do not include those three words, what is that saying to our belief about the cross? What, what did Jesus tell us to continue doing in remembrance of him? It wasn't like just get in a boat like he did. It wasn't walk on the water like he did. What did he tell us to do? Do this in remembrance of me. That's, that's communion. It's reminding us not just of, wow, look how many people Jesus had coming to see this miracle. He fed this many people. Wow. It is, he went to the cross for us. The blood was shed. The body was sacrificed, was given for us. That is where the love comes. That is where the acceptance comes, and that is what has paid the price for our forgiveness. And it's the same for me as it is for you and for all who are listening. Whatever our stories, whatever their stories, God's love, acceptance, and forgiveness is like that bridge that connects us from where we have been to where God wants us to be. And I like crossing that bridge through His love, His acceptance, and His forgiveness. Amen. Now, you write that we're handing down a legacy of alarming dangers to the next generation. Can you explain? Well, when I look at when I look at statistics, I mean, the statistics, I mean, I, I've got statistics all over this desk. I wish I could show to you, but I but I keep it here as a reminder of this is why I'm here. Listen to these numbers. Four million cases of child abuse and neglect every year. Four million. 800,000 12 to 17 year olds using illegal drugs in the United States of America. An estimated 500,000 online predators targeting children. Okay, so those are just a few of the many stats and I include those in the book. What will we do about it? Are we just gonna watch the news and hear the stats and become aware of them? Are we going to just gripe and complain about it? No, I believe that we are all called, not, not just a few of us, not just those with like ministry credentials or some particular degree, but if we are followers of Christ, then our assignment is to invite others into the land of the living, to also be followers of Christ and find his love, his acceptance, and his forgiveness as a part of the story. And, and that's why I chose books, because on those pages, they brought hope to me years ago when I read them. And now I wanted to take the hope that they gave me and pass them on to others. One of the chapters is from the book by C.S. Lewis, Surprised by what? What should we be surprised by? Not just the news, surprised by joy. Isn't that a great word for us to be surprised by? Because it's lacking in so many of the stories and so much of the news. Joy is like, where is it? Where is it? It's like, God is surprising us with this new joy that comes. We believe it comes through Jesus. We believe it comes through the Spirit of God living within us. I loved writing about that, surprised by joy, even after the disappointments and the wounds. Yeah, we, we, we are finding this narrative of joy and writing about it. Hey, hey, I, had, I had five people that I knew that committed suicide during the months I was writing this book. Wow. I'm hearing bad news and more bad news, but in the middle of the bad news, we can still find this beautiful surprise. This the joy of the Lord that's like our strength when we feel so weak and so wounded. His joy gives us hope. 
I remember a pastor many years ago when I was a child said, joy is an acronym, Jesus, others, and you. J-O-Y. I'll never forget that. Chris, in your book, you apologize to readers for invisible verbal abuses handed down by family members, pastors, teachers, and friends, causing yeah. indelible wounds to young people. What do you mean by some of those invisible verbal abuses? As, as I sit here in my office and I'll ask the student, hey, hey how are you doing? And, you know, that's kind of our phrase. Hey, how are you? And everybody says, okay. And how are, but I want to know, how are you really doing? Initially, they may say, okay. But when we go deeper and find out how they are really doing, then we move from the how to the why. Why are you feeling that way? Initially, it's surface conversation, just words they have rehearsed. But when we go deeper, there are tears that they will shed as they begin telling the story of being abused as a child. This, and this breaks my heart. I'm going to cry even talking to you. How they have been abused in church. They are, they're, they're carrying church wounds, religious wounds, legalistic wounds, how they have been treated by parents. Um, I sit right here in this office and I talk to those who have no parents. What, what am I going to say to them? They need me first to listen to their story and to look at them, pay attention to them and show them I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere. I will not leave you. And then maybe if I'm willing to say that and display that, they will hear their heavenly father say, no, I'm not leaving you. Even in the middle of your uncertainty, in your anger, in your disappointment, I am your creator and I love you too much to leave you alone. That, that, those are the words that this generation is desperate for. They're desperate for the words. They may hear it from the wrong voices. We want to raise the volume, but let it be gentle and speak to them those words, those words of kindness. Chris Maxwell is the author of Things We've Handed Down. Chris, thanks so much for joining us today from Georgia. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate it. With the ongoing housing crisis and high inflation levels combined with an opioid crisis, there are some serious challenges for low-income families, those with addictions, and the homeless. Joining us now is Ken Kissick. He is a co-founder of Streets Alive Mission in Lethbridge. Ken, welcome back to Bridge City News. Great to have you on today. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so Ken... Many of our viewers do know what Streets Alive mission is all about, but maybe some don't. So perhaps you can give us a snapshot of what you do here in Lethbridge. Uh, very quickly, we have two streams. One is the mission stream that deals with the vulnerable population. The other stream is uh, helping people in recovery from the addictions. And just in the first three months from January to the end of the March, we had 4,208 people or 4,208 visits to our services in wow. the uh, downtown mission from 1,182 individuals. Um, we added 65 new clients. Uh, within the recovery program, we have a waiting list of 104 people uh, waiting for 55 beds that we currently have that are full. We did 15 intakes in that period of time. So it's high volume. It is we're the closet for the street people, and we are a, a faith-based uh, recovery program that's abstinence-based. So that's, that's us in a nutshell. Yeah, you are very, very needed, especially right now with the crisis that's going on. So, uh, Ken, how bad is the opioid crisis in Lethbridge right now? Has it stayed about the same, or has it improved or gotten worse? It's bad, and it's yeah. getting worse. Yeah. Uh, 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 the... Lethbridge and, and Blood Reserve lost 153 people in 2023 to opioid. It's, it's awful. That's devastating. Yes, yes. And because all of those people were parts of families. So that's devastation just across the board. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, one of the outreaches that you run correct me if I'm wrong, is the Parkside Men's Recovery Home, right? So uh, it's now recognized by the government of Alberta, and I'm told that this recovery center has an impressive success rate of 78%. Uh, 
Yeah, Parkside Home is part of our Recovery Road, which is the recovery program that we run, run for men and women. And our recovery program, we provide housing. This is one of the housing units, uh, which is Parkside. It holds up to 16 uh, men uh, at any given time. Okay, that, that is an impressive success rate that you have there. Uh, that is, uh, that's an overall success rate on an average over a year. So yes, it, we're, we're very proud of it. Okay. So with that said, maybe describe what happens on a day-to-day -day and weekly basis at a home like this. What kind of assistance is offered? So what you're, what you're going to see is you're going to see individuals in both in the men and women's program that are taking programming. They're, they're doing things like prayer and proverbs. They're doing recreational therapy. They're doing Genesis one-on-one -on -one process. So we have a number of people in one-on-ones. They're in group classes. They're in uh, what we call, you know, addictions recovery, which is the, the theory part, the clinical part of that. Uh, and then there's a biblical worldview part. So right now we run about 50% of the program is, is clinical. 50% of the program is biblical worldview. Wow. And the clinical portion of that, is that run by, uh, you know, counselors, psychologists, what, what type of professionals? These are, are all, everybody's in classes. Mm -hmm. uh, these are trained individuals that are trained in uh, being able to manage group therapy. Uh, we do, uh, where we're looking for professional counseling, we will send them out to some of the agencies in town. But a large part, it's just group counseling, one-on-one -on -one, um we're really trying to help them deal with the trauma in their life, walk them through it. Um, it's uh, the, the minimum is 120 days uh, that we ask them to commit to. And then after that, uh, we ask them to commit in, in 90 day chunks. Wow. Okay. So that's a, that's a good chunk there for sure. Uh, now, can the men's recovery home uh, apparently is in need of replacement. And I understand you're looking at a few options right now, including rebuilding on the current location, but a better option became available? Maybe fill us in a little so, bit. Uh, the, the current men's home, uh, we purchased it uh, in 1998. Uh, it was an old building at that time. Parts of the building were built in 1909. Uh, and it just is at a stage where it's run out of life. Any more money that we put into it isn't there. We were wanting to build on a, on a lot that we also own right there, but We've since uh, acquired an eightplex uh, that will allow us to um, basically uh, renovate uh, a parking lot that's underneath and put an addition on it. And we would give us 32 beds uh, in a combined atmosphere. Um, and it's located uh, in a more suitable location, not in the downtown. Okay, uh, Ken, so then if I understand correctly, you already have a large down payment on the building which would house that men's home along with uh, what you're looking at, was it $560,000 commitment from the city toward renovations? So the, the project with purchase and renovation is $2.4 million. Uh, we have $560,000 from the city. We're waiting to hear on an $850,000 grant from the province. Uh, we are running what we call our coming home campaign. If they go to the website, www.streetsalive.ca, they'll see it on the on the top bar. Just click on campaign and uh, you can donate right there. Uh, just mark it for the campaign. Okay. And then can you also see the need for another building to house this uh, stage four men who have worked through their addiction challenges and are re-entering society. So can you tell us a bit about the building that, that became available for this? So there, in this whole process, we were in a process of consolidating our programs. We were spending $350,000 a year plus in lease payments, and we are now actively trying to acquire property where those lease payments will just go into operations. Uh, we had a generous donor who provided uh, uh, close to a million dollars for us. Uh, that allowed us to purchase the Galt Manor, uh, which is an eightplex uh, located um, within the community. And it, we are already using that as stage four housing for a number of our people. So that that's in place. Um, the purchase of the eightplex and its renovation will solidify the recovery prom program because we already own our women's uh, program or our women's housing program. The Segway home is already uh, renovated and paid for. Okay. 
So that's that's at stage four. So I'm assuming the stage one is those first 120 days that they have to commit to. And then would stage two be the additional 90 days that you were talking about? At what point did they get to stage four? Maybe stage take us one and two are the first 120 days. Okay. Then stage three and four uh, take the time after that. Stage okay. three, they usually stay within our programmed housing. And then stage four, a uh, little less accountability, uh, no on-site staff, those kinds of things. More autonomy. Okay. Uh, so, and the next step of that is on their own. Right. So, uh, Ken, how difficult is it for these these gentlemen to find and, and keep a job that will be able to, to pay their bills? Uh, the challenge isn't necessarily getting a job uh, to pay their bills and keeping that job. The challenge is finding a job uh, that will help them continue on their recovery journey. Sometimes the jobs they had, uh, the environment is not conducive uh, to being able to maintain that that recovery. Uh, there are, you know, uh, places that are difficult that they're they're high in things, and so it's trying to align them. We have an employment readiness program that we we will run some of our individuals through because sometimes they haven't been employed for three, four, five, six years. Uh, so there's about a six month program. And then we try and help them find work that's more conducive uh, to what to what's going on. Uh, and of course, our stage four housing is affordable. So it's not market rent. So we're able to help them that way. Okay, oh, that's wonderful. Uh, now, your actual home base for Streets Alive is currently located right downtown across from the court building in Lethbridge. So maybe tell us about the new location and the building that, that you were blessed with. So 30 years ago, God called us to the downtown core. He provided facilities for us because uh, this is where the vulnerable needed the most help and where it seemed like the most hopelessness was. Uh, in January of 23, he released us from here. Uh, and quickly, um, through a series of events, the El Dorado property on the north side, 17,000 square foot building, uh, 2.59 acres came available, and we were able to pull the money together and have purchased it. We uh, are currently leasing it back to the owners because they need to rebuild, uh, but then we'll go in and renovate. The other thing that happened to us in the downtown is the needs has grown. Um, 30 years ago, we had 20 people on the street. Now our street population is in excess of 200. Uh, we were helping 10 or 12 people a day. Now we help 65 or 70. Uh, and so that we just needed more space. Uh, and so it's exciting. Um, the opportunity for us is, is there. God is this project and everything else is, is something he has called us to do. Uh, but the reality is this will only be done with his mar miraculous provision through his people. So those that feel called to help, to simply go to the website and tune in, click on the campaign. There's lots of information there and uh, you can choose to help however you want. Yeah, I, I mean, you, like you said, it's exciting, but at the same time, the fact that there's a need for it, it's kind of like, it's just so <laughs> sad as well. The, the difficulty is, is that 30 years ago, um, we were dealing largely with, with drugs that weren't going to kill you today. Today, we are dealing with, with drugs that will kill you instantly um, and and depending on the batch that you get. So the, the, the need becomes more desperate to help these people get away from the drug life and to be able to move them into something that's a lot better. Uh, the stories you must hear on a daily basis, Ken. Uh, we see them on a daily basis. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, yeah. So uh, getting back to, to your your building plans, um, how are all these plans sitting with the, the city, like the municipality and, and the local community? Is there so, opposition um, to your plan or are you generally getting support for this? Um, for the most part, we have support. There's okay. still always hurdles. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the the eight collect project requires a rezoning and that that's in process, but we had a neighborhood meeting very favorable. The neighbors completely understand what we're trying to do because we've already been there three years. And so they're just looking forward because we're going to upgrade the building. It'll become a nice uh, feature within the community. It, it's 40 years old now, so it needs some some TLC, uh, but then it'll look like a new structure. Oh, that's wonderful. It's that That is definitely, certainly exciting. 
Absolutely. Um, you know, kind of going back to the basics here of, of what you guys do, um, is it completely voluntary for these people to come to you? Yes. Yeah, all of our services and our recovery programming and everything else is voluntary. Nobody is forced to do it and nobody is turned away. Um, uh, obviously, we're a faith-based group, but that's not a criteria for them participating. Um, we're more than willing to help anyone who wants to receive our help. However, we, we make it clear we are biblical-based uh, programming, and uh, a lot of times, most of the people that come in, uh, uh, find they find their help in Christ because he is really the true healer that can help them out of the trauma and the things in their life. Mm -hmm. Do you find that sometimes people have to come back again and again and kind of redo the program with you? Uh, obviously, not everybody is successful off the hop. Mm -hmm. uh, we call ourselves the organization of a million second chances. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, we'll we'll bring there's a process, but we'll always bring people back and through. Uh, but we have a pretty high success rate of, of those that are committed to getting through it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, we love them and accept them where they are. And then we work yeah. with them, uh, challenge them, keep them accountable. And uh, and and again, we have that success rate that we believe is 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 really great. Right. We did talk a lot about men's uh, help there, but you help women as well, of course, don't you? Yeah, we we have uh, we have up to uh, we up to, we have up to fourteen women in the same kind of a program. Some of the programming to do that we do is uh, joint, and some is as as a close. But yeah, uh, and the the women are about the same rate of success as well. Um, our residences are our homes. That's what we try to create them to be. And and we create that home environment and and uh, and we we give strength to it. And we're very excited about a lot of the successes. Um, we are seeing families reunited, uh, men getting uh, visitation and custody rates back to their children, uh, uh, those kinds of things. And it, this is just all God and his handiwork as people commit themselves to allowing him to heal them. Fabulous. And maybe really quickly remind us uh, how viewers can donate to the cause. Streetsalive.ca. Click on a donate button and uh, you can you can donate through Canada Helps. You can donate online. You can send us a check. Uh, the address is on the website. And if not, it is 323 4th Street South, Lethbridge, Alberta, T1K2G1. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Ken, for speaking with us today. So great to have you on again. Thank you very much for having me. It was great. Ken Kissick is the co-founder of Streets Alive Mission in Lethbridge. I'm Jeanette Roche on behalf of all of us here at Bridge City News. Thanks so much for watching.